Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are going to talk about mergers and acquisitions and really the opportunity out there for today's builders. And I want to welcome Margaret Whelan. I'm so thrilled she's here to join us. Uh, for those of you who don't know Margaret, everybody just about does, but Margaret's the Chief Executive Officer and Founder with Whelan Advisory Capital Markets. She's notably one of the best in the industry. She's bright, brilliant, um, and I always love doing this kind of stuff with her because I always learn a ton. Uh, she's really been involved. She's raped, raised over $30 billion in the capital market over her 25 plus year career. She's represented so many companies, a lot of uh, which I'm affiliated with as well. She's done some really neat things. Um, and we're going to get into some of the details on the top builders, the top markets, and really what you should be looking for in the future as it relates to M&A. I want you to hang out to the end because we're going to do a live Q&A too. So please join us um, at the very end as well. This will go just about an hour, maybe a little bit over. So again, hang out to the end and we'd love to hear from you as well and keep you involved. Real quickly, this is the agenda for today. I'm going to go through an introduction. Again, we're going to touch on some of the work we did originally on the builder side, looking at who's performing um, and uh, who to pay attention to. We'll go through some of the M&A opportunities with Margaret. We're going to look at some of the growth factors overall, uh, some overall valuation drivers. And then, of course, we're going to bring it down to some of the market you're in. We're going to look at regional trends and what the opportunities are there. And then we'll wrap up with conclusions. And again, hang in till the end so we can do some open Q&A with all of you live. So quick introduction. Those of you, you know us, of course, throughout uh, with Zonda. We have an advisory team throughout the country with Tim and Kimberly and Todd and, of course, Allie on the economic front. Um, if you haven't already, we have these great local market snapshots where the markets you're in or even markets that you're looking at. These are really great, I call them cheat sheets almost, to just get all the quick answers you want. So request it. You can do a quick little a QR code or reach out to me directly and I'll get those to you. Uh, but it's a great way to look at new markets. It's a great way to stay on top of the markets you're in. And then of course, Allie, I think she's notably probably the best in the country from an economic perspective, looking at all the things that are happening. If you wanna stay out in front, on all the things that are shifting and changing, uh, please join us for that national outlook between she and Tim. They cover quite a bit um, on their, their local economic front, but also in the piece that she's creating now uh, regularly. Um, we have new home source. As all of you know, BDX and Zonda are now together as one. We have so many cool things happening today and where this is going in the future between New Home Source and Livable Together. There's really some great opportunities here. If you're not listening with us today, please uh, reach out on this one. Karen Bonder, again, you can reach out to me and I'll connect you to the right people as well. Last but not least, we have great events coming. Um, we were always planning, you know, how to plan for the future and Future Place is a great place to plan for the future, particularly the future of master plan communities. So we have experts from all over the country talking about where the market is going next, how to plan, whether it's segmentation, technology, you name it. There's some really great opportunities there. So scan this and register. Um, we'd love to have you join. So with that, we're going to dive into now the next portion and content uh, of this presentation. And we're going to get into the details with Margaret. We're going to first talk just about growth and opportunity and just really big picture stuff. If you look at overall household growth for the country, it's expected to hover around kind of the historical average. So not huge growth ahead for the next five years, but what's really different is where that growth is happening. So when we look at population growth, yes, it's down, but we're seeing a lot more single and non-family households. So the shift in the kind of housing, the things that we're creating housing for in the future, is definitely gonna see some change. Now let's look at really where population growth is. Largely, and, and I've covered this in a lot of webinars in the past, most of that growth is really going to Texas, the Southeast and Florida. Now, don't get me wrong, there is growth everywhere throughout the whole country. You're gonna see that in some of the things that Margaret talks to, but the majority of that growth, where we're seeing big growth and a lot of the top builders really flooding towards is Texas, the Southeast, and Florida, but there's certainly opportunity throughout, and you're going to see that. 
When we look at the ratio of that growth though, four times the growth is happening in that area. It also represents 62% of the closings. And you're gonna see that as we talk about top builder performance. So let's look at that. Again, this is from the Builder 100 webinar that I covered before. If we look at the top builders, Dear Horton and Lennar are a big chunk. I think it's 25% of the overall market share is just for mm -hmm. those builders. So, so quite a bit of market share here. And, and again, when we look at now the closings by state, we don't see quite the same percentage for the Southeast, but again, uh, a big, huge number happening there in Texas and Florida and the Southeast. And Margaret, you know, I mean, that's where we're just seeing so many of the builders going to because it's either the boomers or those move down buyers moving into Florida. We have so many different young consumers that are going to Texas really for jobs and all the other stuff. And the Southeast has historically served as kind of a back office to the Northeast, but it's growing in so many different ways, even the Carolinas with move down products. So really interesting to see where the actual closing stuff is. So here, Margaret, tell us a, a little bit about the M&A opportunities and some of the stuff that's actually going on here. You have such great insight and I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Well, and I appreciate getting to do this with you, Molly, because you and I are both alike in that we're data junkies. And every <laughs> year I anxiously await the local leader data that Zonda and your team prepares. And for the benefit of the audience, if you don't know what it is, it is the top 50 cities across the country. And then a ranking of the top 10 builders for 2023, we just got in May of 24, the top 10 builders by units. And what's fascinating to me is that I always assumed the, build, the bigger builders were trying to get bigger in the bigger markets. But actually today, the big builders have over 50% market share in 49 of those 50 markets. So they're running out of room, which is why they're getting bigger in all of these cities. And Lennar and Horton together have the number one or two position in, I think it was 38 of the 50 cities. So what you're seeing is that the level of concentration has increased dramatically. And if you go to the next slide, Molly, what we were talking about in our prep call is that the top five cities together are about a third of new home sales and the top 10 together are half of new home sales, which means that as a builder, a bigger builder, a buyer versus a seller, what the buyer really needs to think about is where am I today versus where do I want to be and how am I going to get there and where will I have the most impact? Because the big builders, like you said, Lennar and Horton, 25% market share between the two of them, they've just gotten so big. So if you're competing with them, how do you really catch up? Now, well, when you look... Mm -hmm. And, there, and there's two ways to look at this slide too, right? Like if you want to be a top builder, you can see the markets that they're in. But if you don't want to compete with a top builder, <laughs> you can see the markets that they're not in, right? Anyways, keep going, Mark. Yes. Yeah. No, so go, well, but, you know, and that's a great way to think about it because we do have lots of fantastic private builders, in particular some of the regionals in the Midwest, these third, fourth generation family companies. What I was going to say is if you look at the next slide, Molly, where you and I really date ourselves because we've been around since the early <laughs> 90s, is that when I started my career anyway, the bigger builders, the public builders together, the 10% market share. And today it's actually 50. It's grown by about 15 points in the last five years because the uh, whole uh, COVID pandemic era was very tough on private builders. And the big builders were able to take advantage of that and get exponentially bigger. And so in our estimation, the big builders today have more than half of the market share overall, but uh, they also drive two thirds of their growth. About 70% of the unit growth is driven by M&A. And that's the buyers saying, all right, I want to be in this city or this type of product or this price point, and I'm not there already. And the most efficient way, time cost efficient way for me to go there is to pay a premium and buy a, another company in that city. So what do you need for uh, to drive that growth and that acquisition activity? It's cash. And if you go to the next page, what you're seeing clearly is how much uh, cash flow the big builders have. This is an aggregate from the public filings for the 22 or so public builders that report earnings every quarter. And so with COVID, they were able to double their price, their average home price over about five years. Most of them were able to hold 
that high pricing, right? We've seen a little bit of margin erosion because of mortgage buy downs in the last year or two. But we estimate that half of the cost of building a house is sticks and bricks, Molly. And most of those costs have normalized. At the same time, home prices have stayed up very strong. And so most of the builders have record profit margin, both top and bottom line margin. They're retaining more earnings. So the balance sheets, the book value is growing up. And as all of that goes together, they can borrow against that very strong uh, balance sheet and or use the cash they have to drive the acquisitions. Well, and I think one other thing, too, is we're not only seeing the buy downs out there, but we're also seeing the builders and rightly so, by the way, shifting the size of their homes, too. So mm -hmm. while the, the gross price is coming down, there's a huge focus on the fact that affordability is shifting out there. And mm -hmm. so they shift their their plan on what they're building and some of that stuff. So I think that's probably a, a part of that as well. But wow, is it staggering to see what happened when you look at 2020? On, I mean, that's just remarkable. One question for you, too, on the, the public versus private. I mean, is it fair to say the publics have a huge advantage, you know, being a public builder during those more, more difficult times, just given, you know, their access to, to cash and all the things that mm -hmm. go for the private guy? You know, they're kind of fighting for their lives, unfortunately, and that, and that becomes really the challenge uh, and the advantage um, for the private versus public, right? Well, being a public com company is considered the holy grail of capital for, uh, on Wall Street, where I spend my life. Um, and the reason is because it's permanent capital. You can always issue equity. And so, and you always have that currency there and it's been established. So yes, it's not surprising that they've been able to leverage that. But then they also, on the debt side of the balance sheet, they have um, staggered their maturities in a very responsible way. Anytime rates come down, you see eight or 10 builders go raise another five-year or 10-year bond. And so they are recycling the capital as they go, and they're very astute about it. And so I think what you'll hear from a lot of the buyers is, look, we don't want to pay the dumb tax. We want to be in that city, but we need 500 units to make a difference. So we're not going to take five years to get there. We're just going to do a big acquisition. Right. No, that makes total sense. Uh, what I think is interesting about this slide, and again, it's 30 years of data, is just our industry housing is not just cyclical and rates and mortgage uh, rates go up and down in a five to six year pattern usually, but M&A activity can be very cyclical as well. What we see on average over the 30 years is that we'll close about six deals a year, but it has been more than 26 some years. And you and I had talked about a year ago, Molly, and I told you I thought we were teeing up for a record M&A year, and we're definitely seeing it. I mean, since the very beginning of this year, we've had home builder IPOs. We've had a huge consolidation. My team and I are closing two deals in the next uh, four or five weeks. We've closed, I think, six already since the beginning of the year. And if you go to the next slide, what's interesting is that about 40% of the deals that are getting closed right now are with these Japanese buyers. So you've heard me say before that uh, the Japanese buyers are getting much more comfortable Daiwa House, Sekisui House, they know housing, obviously, they're global enterprises, massive companies, and they're getting increasingly comfortable, meaning they're doing more deals, bigger deals, cash deals, or buying 100%. In the past, they had been structuring their deals, and now that they're more comfortable, they're doing these bigger deals and buying 100%. Well, it's really interesting, because when we look at the top builders and, and even the Builder 100 list, I mean, it's really changing the dynamic of even how we track those, right? So. Mm -hmm track it largely by the builders themselves, but to some degree, we need to shift it to sort of the background behind, you know, who owns the variety of these companies. And so like, it's it's really becoming very interesting as the dynamic and the, the money behind these builders shifts. Particularly, mm -hmm. I agree. Well, let's talk a little bit about the top growth factors and some of that. We're going to look at really those top builders, what they did to be successful, and we'll dive into that. So as we look to the top builder share of total new home closings, and you can see this by region, you'll see. I mean, this is exactly what Margaret was referencing. DR Horton is sitting there in sort of the top uh, four regions. We've got NVR, which really dominates the Northeast, and you're going to see why. And then we've got Lennar in California. They really split, uh, I like to call it a town, but certainly it was the whole state and quite a big state. And then certainly when you look at the Northwest, they're actually winning there as well. 
when we look at the markets and we look at who's actually winning in those markets and we look at the overall price points there, you can see a huge change in the top number one and number two as you go throughout there and how different those price points are as you look at those uh, throughout the regions. The top 10 really are are really playing in the heart of the market. And as we talked about, the sizes are getting a little bit smaller. I think they've fallen nationally about 200 square feet, a little bit more than that. But overall, the top 10s are playing in that under 2,500 square feet. Now, it always makes me smile because consumers always say like, oh, I want a bigger home or I'm transferring across, I, I, I want more. But I will tell you this, you have to remember where they're coming from. So I remember for millennials, they'd say, oh, I want a bigger house. Well, they could be coming from a 700 square foot house. They could be coming from 1200 square feet. So remember, it's all relative. Uh, it's not necessarily that homes are always getting smaller, but when we look at the dynamic and the population that's moving today, homes are still getting bigger for them because we are seeing that shift going from boomers being the number one segment to now uh, these young families that are growing and just trying to find the right home uh, that fits them. And then when we look at absorptions and you look at overall absorptions for these builders, you'll actually see the play and being sort of the top ranked builder, you're doing somewhere between four and seven a month. The Midwest is the only anomaly at 3.1, but overall, the largest builders are selling pretty, pretty quickly, and that's in that four to seven a month. Let's look a little bit at those individual builders, see how they're performing. If we look at DR Horton, um, again, they're 14% of the market share, um, clearly over 80,000 closings, uh, definitely a big one to contend with. They're almost all detached. Their price point is a very value-oriented price point, so under 400,000 in price, and the overall lot size is under 7,000 square feet, but a pretty big lot size when you compare it to some of the others. So again, they're very significant in Texas, the Southeast and Florida, those top markets that we talked about. So when we look at overall uh, price point though, look at all the yellow on this screen. And the reason why I say focus on the yellow, you're gonna see the shift amongst the other uh, three that we're gonna focus on. And you'll see so much of what they're doing is detached under 400,000. And oh, by the way, in California, while that's not quite so yellow, anything under the blue color <laughs> is really affordable there too. So uh, again, very affordable overall. And where you start to see some uniqueness there is because they're largely in the detached world, you see lots of blue on this, but really seeing um, some of the attached in the Chicago area, even a little bit Minneapolis, but look at all of the attached in the Utah market. That's a huge shift, but think about it. When we talk about growing in size and we talk about that, uh, those young families starting out, they're just trying to own first and then move up from there. So it is really interesting. And then the other part of it is exactly what I talked about, which is the kinds of households that are moving today. We're seeing more single population and some of that. So you're going to see some of that uh, dynamic here for Lennar as well. So Lennar, again, they're uh, a little over 10,000 less than D.R. Horton, but I suspect they're going to be a force to contend with in the number two and number one positions. They're almost 12% of the overall market share. When you look at where they're at, I'm gonna show you that relationship throughout the country. Now they're almost 80% detached, but you're gonna see some variation specific to geography that makes them number one in these individual regions. So their overall closing price is 479 versus the under 400,000 for DR Horton. And they have a little bit more segmentation happening throughout, and, and I'll show you that and how that kind of works. So when you look at those price points, again, not quite as yellow as the last screen. So you start to see more of the $500,000 and $600,000 price points in the Minneapolis area, uh, quite a bit of diversity in the Florida market and the Northeast. But where you see significant differences is in the markets that they're dominating, like California, Washington, Oregon, um, Utah, uh, Denver. And so it really starts to shift there. And so again, once again, targeting affordability in Texas, Southeast and Florida is really helping them to pull those numbers. So now when we look at attached and detached, where you start to see the big differences here is Lenora has done a really good job from a segmentation perspective in California and a lot more segmentation in Florida and heavily towards the attached in the Northeast. And then again, Chicago, 
Minnesota. Again, a lot more attached and detached. Again, nice segmentation, a nice spread. And then of course they have uh, quite a bit in the Northwest with Washington and Oregon. Um, overall, DR Horton and Lenar, here's the number. It's, it's one in four of the overall market or 25%. Now we jump to number three. I love Pulte. They're uh, again, um, a fantastic builder as well, but significantly behind Lennar at, you know, 74,000 plus or minus. They're at 28,603. They're just under 5% of the market share. But what's really interesting is when you start to look at their numbers. So again, they are almost 90% detached. So they have opportunity to move into some more of the attached segments. But look at their closing price by comparison, right? So Lennar was, you know, almost 500,000 on average. DR Horton's under 400,000. And here's Pulte on average at 635,000. So quite a difference. And we know absorption ties with those lower price points. And therefore, uh, that's probably stalling them a little bit in their market share. But of course, we also need the land uh, to make that all happen too. So again, they're almost two times the price point for DR Horton. Mm -hmm. So now, now look at the screen. So now that yellow is slowly but surely disappearing. <laughs> um, definitely a lot less uh, action in the California markets, a lot less action in the Vegas markets. They're still very, uh, very prevalent in Florida. Texas, the Southeast, a lot less action than the Northeast, uh, but in some unique markets like Cleveland, Michigan, of course, the, the heart of where they all grew up and where they all started there. So it's so interesting to see some of the variations and, and how different that is, but uh, price is the, a big difference for that. Molly, the other thing that's interesting to me about Pulte is I remember 15 years ago when we worked with them on their acquisition of Centex and together those two companies we're creating the biggest builder in the country and just how they slipped. I think they've pivoted with new management to a quality versus a quantity strategy. And that's why they're so much smaller in units than Horton and Lennar. Well, and it's really interesting because I, I, I can remember being with Pulte and, and we were number one in volume at the time. And I can even remember having the conversation like, well, it's really, you kind of want to win in the the gross revenue number or probably net revenue number, right? So it is clearly about revenue, but the revenue numbers are dramatically different as well. Mm -hmm. um, and definitely they're much more cautious about their acquisitions. And I think if you go back to where they really pulled back on acquisition, say 2012 and greater, I think that's really where they lost some traction as well. Um, mm -hmm. But they have the opportunity through M&A and all kinds of things, I think to pick that traction right back up, right? Absolutely, if they want to. Absolutely. So now if we look at sort of the attached and detached, again, remember this one, this builder is almost 90% detached. And then you'll see largely in the Northeast, they're playing largely in the attached, not a ton in the detached. Um, and in California, again, a lot less there. And, and we talked about the markets where I think they're really hitting it and where they've got some opportunity. Now, when we look at NBR and you look at their closings, um, they come down even further at 20,000 or almost 21,000. They're almost 4% of the market share. But this number is actually a pretty dramatic number. And Margaret, I think you'd agree with me on this one when you look at where they are geographically. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they're accomplishing that number largely in the Northeast, Florida, Southeast. They go nowhere towards the West. And I'm always curious as to why they haven't moved that model throughout the whole country. Uh, they're somewhere in between. I love the Ryan model and the NB model. For those of you who really know this builder, it's it's really two brands for them. And Ryan hits the affordable play and NB hits the luxury play. And you'll see they have quite a bit more attached I think the East Coast is attached better than the West Coast. And I think the West Coast does small lot detached better than the East Coast. But again, if Northeast were to, uh, to sort of move some of that attached product, it's just more efficient, simple roof lines. Um, you can look at their row townhomes and even their flats. It's just a much more efficient and quite frankly, lot lower direct construction costs. They tend to push to bigger square footage. There's a lot of reasons why I believe the East Coast does attach so much better. 
So well, again, NBR is also the number one or number two builder in seven cities nationally. And that's basically all the cities that they're in. So they're going for being a, a big fish in a small pond, I guess, and also in contiguous markets in the Northeast primarily. Absolutely. And, and you can see they are the biggest builder in the Northeast. So again, uh, they're a force definitely to be to contend with. So the next one is, you know, and, and again, and you'll see, I think they have opportunity everywhere, not just the West, but certainly in Florida, they have more opportunity there. But I think they have opportunity. They just move their operations. And if they wanted to go West, go West MBR. <laughs> again, another acquisition opportunity, in my opinion. So, so now as we get to sort of their price points, you can actually see they have quite a variety in price points, but you see a lot more yellow on the screen. And that really is the, the Ryan portion of this where they go after a much more affordable price point, but it's also where they go after 40% in the attached world, not just like many of these other builders that are close to 90% in the detached world. And that really helps them pick up steam, helps them pick up market share for sure. Again, you can see where it's mostly affordable. And again, absorptions come in with that. Then if we look at attached and detached, this is where you can really see the big differences in attached. And it's not largely just in one location. I mean, certainly they have a lot of attached in the Northeast, but moving into the Carolinas and certainly even in Nashville, you can see it in Indiana, you can see it in Florida. Um, and again, I think they have a huge opportunity to grow West. I wanted to show you this because when you look at these top four builders, I want you to see their geographies. If you're looking to expand your businesses and you want to see sort of where this is coming from, I love that I have this as a kind of DR Horton. That looks like Dr. Horton. So <laughs> that too. I mean, yeah, that too, exactly. The doctor of home building. But if you look at this, you'll start to see if I put Lennar on here, look at how much more activity Lennar has in California as an example. So there's an opportunity a little bit more when you look at some of their activity in, in where they're going in, like the Oregon market, for example, Northeast. Now let's throw Pulte on top and you'll see where Pulte is showing up where nobody else is showing up. And that is again in Cleveland and in Michigan and a little bit more in Arizona. And you'll start to see the New Mexico area pops up. Um, where do they have opportunity? They're not in Salt Lake, they could do more in Denver, you know, mm -hmm. things like that for sure. And now- We're seeing a lot of interest in the Utah markets right now from buyers. It's it's really interesting. I think Utah or Salt Lake is probably one of the best kept secrets in the country. It's nicely centrally located. I don't think there's a single person there that isn't like as nice as ever. Like every time I get on a flight going to Salt Lake, I'm like, is everybody nice here? <laughs> There's no grumbling, uh, lots mm -hmm. of adorable kids. It's it's great. But um, so as we throw NDR on this, I mean, look how they just dominate the Northeast compared to all the other builders. I mean, it's really amazing. They've got um, a really nice operation in Cincinnati where there's more activity there. You can start to see a little bit more activity in certain locations in the Southeast. But again, lots of opportunity for acquisition in other areas in the country or just frankly expand. So when we look at all of that, now just compare it to where the growth is, right? So if we look at the top geographies for these top builders and where that growth is, it ties very much with where, you know, the strongest activity is, but where is it missing? Uh, Idaho, not nearly mm -hmm. as much there. I, I know builders got hit hard in Idaho, but they also got hit hard in Idaho because the market grew so fast and so much in appreciation, right? Um, look at South Dakota. Um, look at Vegas in some of those areas. Look at the Utah market. Um, some of those areas, I think, really have some fantastic opportunities um, and opportunities for growth. So the, the other thing when you look at the Boise's or the Utah markets, um, what, what has happened, I think, is that in a pre-COVID world, about 10% of Americans who are employed were working from home full time. And then during COVID, it was 60%. For the last couple of years, it has normalized at over 30%. So a third of professional Americans are now working from home, either full time or in a hybrid situation. That allows you to be remote and to work in Salt Lake City versus San Francisco and have a much better quality of life with lower cost of living because you have a bigger home. It's, you know what, Margaret, it's such a great point. 
So we're doing a lot of consumer research throughout the country. And I'll give you just one number from a survey we just recently did just here locally in Orange County. And these numbers range anywhere from this number to like 30%. But the number of people that are actually working full time in the Orange County market, the, the most recent number I have is eight, eight, single digit, 8%. Wow. That means that 92% of the working population in Orange County are actually, they have some form of a hybrid situation based on the new home shopping population. And by the way, this sample was ginormous, if that's a word, mm -hmm. okay? or ginormous. <laughs> Very so, big. So when you look at uh, like Colorado and Texas, those numbers range anywhere from 25 to 30% are going into the office full time. That means that over 50% of the population in the majority of the markets that we're actually surveying want some sort of a hybrid situation. And part of it today is just employee retention, right? I mean, there's mm -hmm. so many opportunities to do that. So um, with that, I want to turn it back over to you. And let's talk about some of the valuation drivers. I love this next slide. And so uh, tell us a little bit about this. Sure. And so when you think about growing a home builder, you need two big things. One is lots of land, and then the second is talent. But from a buyer's perspective, when they're thinking about M&A, they need to understand what geographic market that they want to be in relative to where they are. And if they want to go into a new market, they'll pay a bigger premium than if they want to get bigger in a market that they're already in and they just want to buy lots. So geographic market is the first screening tool. The second is the type of product. And this is where I think you add a ton of value, Molly, because you and your team really understand the different types of builders by city, what they're good at, what they're not, whether they're taking entitlement risk, whether they're a developer, whether they're just buying finished lots, is a move up product, is it active adult, right? You can screen that very quickly. And that's why we work together a lot on the M&A side. And so, yes, we like the geographic market. Yes, we like the city. Okay, now what is the lot count? And I feel like it's a bit like Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold. About <laughs> three years of lots, which is your trailing 12 month units. If you're selling 500 homes a year, then your three year lot count is around 1500 homes. That's where the buyer is going to apply the biggest premium. After that, as I said, talent, the management team, there's just nobody in our industry who has too much talent right now. Local people is such a local business, having access to other local folks, the contractors, the lot developers, folks who get the lots entitled, whatever it is. And then once you put that together, you give them cash, right? The buyer is going to pay a premium to accelerate the growth. And the more growth they anticipate, the bigger the premium that's going to be. But typically, we're seeing sellers that are going to double their unit volume every three or so years. And that's what the buyers are looking for. The last but not least is return on invested capital. And if you go to the next slide, I broke this down a bit because return on invested capital or return on net assets or return on net equity. It's really just your profit multiplied by your asset turn on the balance sheet, whichever one you want to use. The builders that have the highest return on capital have the highest multiple on their stock. And the way the private builders are being valued is relative to how the public builders are trading. So today, even though Pulte has given up a lot of ground in terms of units and being the leader in, in terms of total units nationally or by year, they still have an incredible return on invested capital. And I think that's one of the things Ryan did very well when he turned, he Impressive. came in as CEO. Yeah, he, he pivoted. Yeah to quality versus quantity and really focusing on return on capital. Uh, NVR or Smith Douglas, they're not on this page because they'd be so far up there in the, in the top quartile. But when you put those two together, what you're seeing here is that the y-axis is the multiple of book value and the x-axis is return on invested capital. Now, Molly, if you look at the next slide, what's interesting That's is that- That's an awesome slide. I love that slide. Yeah, well, well, it's it's showing you what you control. And sure. so what we're looking at here is how the publicly traded builders have traded on average for the last decade. And it's at 1.4 times book value. Today, they're trading at just over 1.4 times. So they're trading at higher than a 10-year average. And that means it's a good time if you're going to sell your company, multiples are high. But what's been really fascinating to me in the last year or two, I guess since post-COVID, because there are so many buyers with so much money from so many markets globally, that we are seeing small private companies that are less liquid sell at an average of 2.2 times book value, which is a 50% premium to where 
the publicly traded, the big Absolutely. liquid publicly traded companies are trading. Usually small illiquid companies sell at a discount, not a premium, but it is because they are facilitating the growth and because the nature of the market right now, it's a buyer's market, the window is absolutely open because, or it's a seller's market because we have so many buyers with so much cash, the sellers can realize these very strong premium. And I don't expect that to change, Molly. We definitely need certainty in the economy for M&A to, to percolate because it'll take us six months from start to finish to get a deal closed. So the seller needs to feel very good about their results, their key performance indicators, their backlog, their lot supply, their community count, everything that's ahead of them in the next six months, they have to have their arms around. But if they do, they'll realize that record premium over two times right now. You know, it's, it's so fascinating. And I would imagine, and I know you had a recent um, acquisition that you worked on um, in Indianapolis, the reality is it's also those unique markets that really, I think, increase your value as well. So it's where that builder wants yes. to do. Yes. I love that first slide that you have because it's more than just buying land. It's mm -hmm. more than just buying lots. You're buying a, an expertise and a management team that really understands that market and can help that, you know, whether it's a bigger builder or a builder that's just continuing to expand, grow. And mm -hmm not just in the land it's in the you know true asset which is you know the people behind it in addition to the land right mm -hmm. it's, it's fascinating to me okay so now let's look at some regional trends we're going to dive into that and um again you can see our top 10 builders you can see where they did it um and again we're going to focus largely on those different regions and then who are the top three in each one of those regions so you can see again Horton across the board and Lenar across the board where they sort of volley back and forth. And we'll dive into that now by region. So let, let's look at Florida, top three. And you're going to see these top three pretty consistently through most of these regions. And it's Horton, Lenar, and Pulte. Now, again, Lenar and, and Horton are in a, a very tight race um, for this one. But I want to show you their growth in relationship to where we're actually seeing population growth. So the darkest green being the heaviest in population. And now you're going to see how that relates to those builders. Okay, so let's look at, at DR Horton, Lennar, and Pulte. You can see where that concentration is. You can see largely Lennar and Horton, very heavy sort of in the middle. Pulte definitely is kind of throughout, but sprinkled throughout for sure. And now let's look at that again in relationship to those growth. So as you kind of see that, you'll start to see where the heaviest growth kind of sits through those most affordable locations. Certainly villages, you can see that in the central portion of Florida, and we continue to see ridiculous growth there, but there's still a lot of opportunity as you look uh, throughout this slide where builders aren't uh, and where that growth is going. As we look at Texas, Horton number one, then Lenar, and then Pulte really falls, I think substantially below Horton and Lenar here. But when you look at where the growth is, again, I call it the four majors between Austin, San Antonio, Houston, and Dallas, you can see the relationship to where the transaction activity is here. And you'll see, um, again, where Pulte is versus DR versus Lennar. And now let's look at that in relationship to where that growth is once again. And again, pretty spot on, I think, for Texas. Uh, a few little opportunities I can see there where the builders haven't gone that could be opportunity for the future. As we dive into the Southeast, DR Horton is the clear winner. So if Lenara wanted to gain more market share, they should be looking at this market because they're substantially behind Horton at half. And then of course, NBR comes in at number three and Pulte moves to number four. I feel like I'm I'm doing a horse race here, Margaret. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but to some degree we are, right? <laughs> Getting up. <laughs> So as you, as Quite a you, difference, though. I mean, it's not yeah. easy to go from four to eight or eight to 16, right? I guess that's the point. Absolutely. So as you look at sort of where the growth is throughout these different states, you can see the Carolinas along the coast. You can see the Atlanta markets. You can see quite a bit of opportunity in the Nashville or Tennessee markets. And so when we look at where all of that growth is kind of throughout, um, you'll actually see where MVR really dominates. You can actually see where Lennar really dominates. You can actually see where Horton is pretty consistent throughout and in a few locations, a little bit more active than some of those other markets as we look at sort of the, um, the Gulf area. 
And so if you look at where the growth is, it's really fascinating to me. Again, I, I love to sort of see where that actual activity is. And you look at where that growth is. Again, opportunities, I think, for sure here. But largely, the builders got it right. And I think they're following that path uh, appropriately for this location. Again, opportunities on that one for Lennar. Now, when we look at Horton and Lennar, again, really close race here between those two. Pulte jumps back up to number three and then KB to number four. And as we look at those markets and where the growth is largely here, you can actually see in relationship to where all the activity is. Again, clearly you can see Horton and Lennar up in the Salt Lake area, Pulte, a huge opportunity for them. And I know they've tried to go into that market even back in the day when I worked there, but certainly an opportunity for them. You can look at Vegas and Phoenix, uh, a lot of activity with both, but probably more uh, opportunity for Horton in the Las Vegas market and then up to uh, the Denver market, for sure, more opportunity for Pulte. Um, and uh, interesting to then compare that with the growth. Again, I think they're hitting that pretty spot on for the most part, um, but certainly more opportunity. Now let's move over to California. Without a doubt, Lennar is winning this race, no question. Um, they're about three times important, if I've got that math right, pretty darn close to it. Um, and you can actually see it's clearly Horton, then KB. Pulte drops down from number three in most markets and really comes down to number six in this market. But Meritage steps up, Taylor Morrison rivals Pulte head to head in this particular one. And when we look at the growth here, now remember, unfortunately, unfortunately, people love California. They just can't afford California. So mm -hmm. some of them are moving to Vegas and to Phoenix and to Texas. When you look at the migration from California, it's crazy. Um, we really need to figure out how to keep more people. And part of that's just more affordable housing solutions. I'm so passionate about finding new product solutions because of this picture you're seeing right in front of you. Yeah, um, It's crazy. And so let's look at where they're going. Um, for the very first time working both in Northern and Southern California for a big portion of my career, we are moving to markets that we never thought we would move to. And it's really interesting to see all of the push for new housing activity move towards the Central Valley. So markets like Merced and the Turlock area and Lodi and um, Bakersfield and Fresno. And again, it's really just providing those affordable choices in those markets. But look how active Southern California and Northern California are despite uh, the prices and again a lot of that mm -hmm. so much of that like you just gotta get creative right so when you look at that growth you can see again i'm going to go back and just do that a little bit slower if you look at where the activity is there are builders still performing very well in markets that are shrinking frankly because it's just such a low slide high opportunity for the right product and and this is a market this is where innovation comes in and can really pay off and and these builders are stepping up I really commend Lennar and the California markets because they are providing more of those attached unique solutions that oftentimes, you know, it's easier, frankly, to, to not come up with solutions in there. But in California, they're really pushing it and, the, and they're winning because of it. Um, as we move over to the Northeast, clear winner here, almost the same relationship here. If Lennar and Horton want to win, they've got to move a lot more into the attached markets like MVR is and they really have to pick up those affordable price points. Now, Horton's playing in the affordable price points, but largely in the detached space. And that's where the Ryan portion of the MVR is winning. And it's hard to even contend with the MV side. They do a great job. Their costs are well-positioned and frankly, uh, well-positioned from a land perspective too. So when we look at the overall sort of where that growth is, again, you can see, sorry about that. You can actually see where they are uh, in relationship to that. Someone could also of, buy NVR. That would be, you know, yeah, exactly. Well, that's interesting. If, if they were ever willing, that certainly would yeah. be an interesting play for sure. That's really interesting. You know what? Uh, my bet is that NVR could buy someone else too. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, you can even see reverse mergers where smaller companies buy bigger companies like when NV bought Ryan back in the day. That, that's a really interesting point, because when you look at their share, I mean, it's really phenomenal. Mm -hmm. But overall, uh, I the other part that I really love about NVR is 
just again, and I've said this multiple times, I don't mean to be a commercial for them. They're just really good on their cost and their product is just very streamlined. So as we move into, um, you, we saw the growth, we talked about that. I think that's spot on. I, I will tell you just a little bit about that market too. That's another market where there are high demand areas with low to no supply. And so I think there continues to be more opportunity there with the right product innovation. Let's move to the Northwest. So, and I'm doing these in the order, by the way, of how these markets are performing. The Northwest is a tough market to work in, particularly Washington. Entitlement's extremely challenging. And those that survive there, wow, super proud of them. <laughs> I've worked in that market uh, many, many years, and it's it's a difficult mm -hmm. market to work in. Um, but Lennar is winning this one neck and neck with DR Horton. Albeit in the in relationship to the whole market, it's tough to play in this one. Toll Brothers moves up to number three. You know, a beautiful luxury, high end price point. Again, compelling, I think, for that market. Then Taylor Morrison. Pulte drops all the way down to number seven on this one. And and I think you're going to see those numbers move up. Um, it'll be interesting to see how Pulte changes uh, in that market. Overall, mm -hmm. when you look at where the growth is, now pause on this one for a minute when you're thinking about growth. This is not where the builders are for sure. And when you look at things like Idaho and Montana, I mean, Montana is one of the best kept secrets out there. It's really interesting. But the challenge with Montana is they don't have the trays and the cost. Yeah. They will high there. But boy, is it beautiful. And there are land sellers ready, I think, to move in the direction of growth. But where we're not- You need, you need one or two big builders to go in there and the trades will follow them. And then the rest of the builders can go in after that. Otherwise, it's too hard. I totally agree. But you mentioned this earlier, Margaret, and I think you're spot on. When you look at post-COVID movement, a lot of movement went to Montana. A lot of movement went to Idaho. And so those are some of those opportunities for growth now that I think the market has settled. And I think that's what pushed prices up so much. Um, and there was a recalibration there for sure in, in the Idaho market. So overall, when we look at those top three, where are they at? I mean, it's largely Seattle. It's largely in the Portland market. They're great markets for sure. Um, and you can see Lennar's really winning more so in the Seattle market for the most part, and then um, really heavily in the Oregon market as well. Um, you can see where the growth is and where the transaction activity isn't happening. And so there were definitely some opportunities there um, in Idaho again, Montana and so forth. Last but not least, the poor Midwest never really gets the attention it needs. <laughs> so it's we, true, except we just sold pie it. It, you know, it doesn't. And and honestly, when you look at the wealth, and I, I know I say this a lot in some of these webinars, if you look at the wealth in Minneapolis or Minnesota alone, even the Wisconsin markets, it's it's unreal. And so the opportunity is there, but I also think it's another great example of a need for compelling product and not the same product. And there's a lot of sameness, I think, in the Midwest right now. But Horton and Lennar are a neck and neck race, 7.7 um, .7 versus 7.8. Pulte's right behind them. Um, both, all three of them having great operations there. You can see where the growth is. I What I'd love to throw on top of this one is the net worth because it's staggering. But if you look at overall who's performing well, you can see Pulte's got some unique locations and like Cleveland, mm -hmm. Again, the Detroit area where they grew up. And you'll start to see some of that relationship throughout. And then you've got Horton and Lenar acting in the markets that are great markets to be in, like, again, Minneapolis, Chicago, uh, Indiana. Um, and then you've got unique uh, positions for Dear Horton in Cincinnati. So, again, let's look at that relationship to where the growth is. Pretty spot on for the most part. In some cases, you know, I could argue more, more growth in a couple of locations, but I think pretty spot on. But opportunity, I think, just to really pick it up as, as it relates to product and new product positions. So with that, I'm just going to go through like a quick slide on some conclusions. And then, Margaret, if you could kind of wrap, wrap mm -hmm. it for the most part. But if, if you want to win, obviously, you know, you want to work with people like Margaret on the acquisition side. You want to be looking at what builders, you know, what positions, all those kinds of things. If you're looking at acquiring um, those kinds of things, or frankly, even just growing your business. But if you just simply want to grow your business, 
Um, the big things you want to look at is target the highest demand, most affordable price points. Again, that could be in land, it could be in new positions, it could be in, again, builders that are out there. The next one is target the highest growth locations. Make sure you're focusing in the right areas. Where is that expansion for you? Where are you performing? What is your model? And then how does that relate to the future opportunities that are out there? The third one is really diversifying by geography, understanding, well, and frankly, performing in those different geographic locations. A lot of times when we design market positioning studies on where your expansion is, we really try to understand how well do you perform in snow markets? You know, how important is it staying in the sun states? Things like that. That's super important. The next portion is, is diversifying by sort of like, like the fastest growing consumer segments. So mm -hmm. we know today, the biggest segment out there is you know, the millennials are, are forming families, having families, growing families. So that today is the biggest, uh, followed very closely by the boomers who are now all that equity and, and net worth that they're sitting on is starting to release. I suspect that if we see some movement in interest rates down, we're going to see uh, some really nice activity in the move down market. And then um, the last one, or the second to last one is diversify your product. I think in markets like the Midwest, I think they're calling for, for a change in some of the product, but I also just think product type. So you can see where Lenar really excelled in California by bringing in more product types. You can see where NBR has been so successful with 60% detached, not 90% detached. So that didn't get you to that. And you have to be able to for, perform with direct construction costs and the right kind of architecture to be successful when you make those kinds of moves. And then last but not least, you know, it's just understanding the advantages between publics and privates. I guess it depends on who you are, right, Margaret? Because mm -hmm. the privates have an advantage with price, <laughs> especially if they're in those unique markets, right? To, yes. You know, holding some you, of the numbers that you had shared. So you, there's uh, some great regional powerhouses, uh, private companies or uh, private equity companies, but with publicly traded debt, like Weekly, Ashton Woods, in really great market share positions that they don't necessarily have that much of a different advantage or disadvantage versus the public. But I think that's a terrific summary, Molly. And we have received a few questions, which I'm gonna weave into the next couple of slides. One is about if the presentation is gonna be available. And yes, I believe it's being recorded and it'll be available. Another one is about timing of when to go to market. And I was gonna talk about that now anyway. So when a buyer, when a builder comes to me and is thinking about a sale, they often say, at this point, I just feel like I need a jump or get pushed. I want to take control of it. And so I asked them to really focus on three key, key areas. The one is re the first one is readiness and being organized from a financial perspective, a strategic perspective, a legal perspective, just clean everything up so that for the next six to 12 months, your business is going to grow. You have at least three years of lots in front of you. You don't have too many personal expenses on your balance sheet or your P&L, the way a lot of builders tend to have clean up any old liens, legal issues, because small issues become big issues when small companies sell to big companies. So clean all that up. The second one is about timing. And actually, we had a question about this already. Um, certainty, as I mentioned earlier, is what drives timing more than anything else. And so when you think about what's going on and the, the amount of uncertainty in the economy right now, and especially with the election that's pending, initially we thought it was going to be a rematch, now it's feeling a little different. I don't necessarily think that's going to slow housing too much, Molly. I know there's a seasonal slowness right now and people are talking about it, but that happens every summer. I do think we'll have a good fall. We'll generate a lot of cash for closings. And then buyers really want to focus on being ready in the spring selling season. So they're going to be more focused on buying companies, underwriting potential acquisition targets in the second or in the second half of the year, despite the election. And I think what's more important, the timing than anything else is just the fact that rates, the next big move in rates is going to be down. And that's going to make housing more affordable. It's going to make capital and access to growth capital more affordable and really be the liquidity that we're missing in the market right now. If you just uh, hit forward once or twice, Molly, 
The third point on this page is about the advisors that you need. So as we've mentioned, Molly and I work together a lot on M&A, and the reason is that the sellers want to have a very good team around them to help them position their company, make it as crisp as, as possible, make it as easy to digest as possible, especially for the foreign buyers. A great uh, controller or CPA internally and external audit is required, a feasibility study from Zonda, and then a group like ours will put a whole data room together, uh, put a confidential presentation together, a confidential list of folks we want to talk to, and really protect your interests by doing so. Once you're ready and your timing is good, then the next page is the last one, and that is the amount of time it takes to close a transaction. And actually, my job has improved a lot over the last couple of years with COVID because we're doing so many meetings via Zoom. We're closing cross-border transactions via video with Japanese buyers in six months versus 18 months, which it was 10 years ago. And everything is being accelerated. That uh, protects the confidentiality of the transaction. It protects your time as a seller. It's emotional, it's stressful, and just pulling everything together and accelerating it and doing so via video versus in, per in person is important. So assuming you're ready and you're prepared and you have your team around you, about um, two months, four to eight weeks to get ready to go to the market, another two months to get ready to sell the company and what's involved there, just meeting all the different suitors and soliciting a first or second round of offers. And then once you go into an exclusive, it'll take you about two months to get that transaction closed and to fund. Molly, I think that was it in terms of, uh, there was a few more questions. Let's see. Uh, I answered the one. Did you have an opinion on rates or the, uh, uh, the election that came in to me via email, Molly? So read the question. I, and I, I tried to get into the chat and I couldn't see the chat. There's a, I'm in the chat, so I weave some of it in. There was one about the uh, election and uh, rates. So is the election going to impact anything in housing and the same around rates? What's going to happen with mortgage rates? Well, it'll be really interesting. I'm, I, I mean, I clearly that's more of an opinion than, than factual answers that I can give to you. Do I think it will impact the market? It's It's been very interesting and we've clearly seen <laughs> some interesting changes in the election in the last week, but um, I actually think it's gonna have a positive impact. And I do think that rates could potentially come down. I'm in the same camp you are, Margaret, that I think the next big move is down, mm -hmm. but we'll see. Um, I, I stay tuned. I, I mean, I, I, yeah. I, I absolutely could gauge that. Um, historically, as you all know, during an election year, it slows, but I think we are so in the hands of interest rates right now. And, and we're so impacted by that, that, uh, I'm going to answer it with, if rates go down, it's going to have a positive effect. If they yeah. go up, I think we're going to continue to be in more of the, the gray area that we're in now. I, I do want to yeah. add thing, and this was really our last slide here is, um, one of the big things that I really take a lot of pride in is being a builder and developer for 20 years of my own career and understanding the business. And when you look at the slide that Margaret had on, it's it's more than just the land. It's understanding the management team. It's understanding the business. It's understanding, you know, positioning and what happens when the market retracts or, or expands uh, and knowing what that is as a builder. I mean, I, 20 years of my career were there. So you know, if you need help in growing your business or you're thinking about this, um, again, working with Margaret on some of the M&A stuff and even just figuring out strategically what you want to do, that's one of the things that I feel very confident that we do better than um, just about anyone out there because we get the business. Mm -hmm. um, we get your world and we can help sort of map both directions what's going to be the most advantageous for you. So with that are there any other questions that I that we might have missed? I wish I could see that chat, but <laughs> the, there were just about how to get the presentation afterwards. Okay. Okay, yes. And so this is recorded. We actually do share the presentation, the recording of that. It does get posted. And then if you have any specific questions or you want something specific, we do not distribute the slide deck as the slide deck uh, very specifically. Um, but if you would like to see the recording again, I'm happy to send that to you. Reach out to me directly or to Margaret directly if you'd like mm -hmm. to see any of those specific slides for any reason or, or another. Uh, but we're here to help you guys grow your business and 
uh, do what you you would like to do in the future. So um, anything else, Margaret, that you'd like to add? No, just that I think m a is a very sensitive topic. It, it's often sure. confidential. You and I often have these conversations in public about m a and a lot of the questions come in privately, which is fine. As you said, we welcome the opportunity and to talk to everyone who's been on the call today. That, that's a huge point. We almost work, and I'm sure you're like this too, Margaret. It's like a law firm. I mean, mm -hmm. share with us, it, it's 100% confidential and we wouldn't be in business you know, this many years later if it wasn't. So um, Exactly. Thank you so much, Margaret. With it's yeah. as always, um, bright, brilliant. Love spending time with you. It's uh, thank you again. Likewise, we we've done it so many times. We're pros. <laughs> yes. Thank Good you. So much you. For thank, thank you. Me. Bye bye.